An attack on democracy, an attack on freedom of expression and an attack on European sovereignty. That is how European leaders have been describing state-organised hijacking of a Ryanair flight between two EU member countries. After Belarusian authorities forced the aircraft to land in Minsk, activist and journalist Roman Protasevich was bundled away amid fears for his life. So how should the EU respond and what is Vladimir Putin's role in this apparently brazen piracy? On To The Point, we ask Lukashenko orders kidnapping, but is Putin pulling the strings? Thanks very much indeed for joining us here on To The Point. And my guests here in the studio are Olga Drindova, political scientist from Belarus. Her opinion is that Belarusians should not be punished with sanctions and locked inside Belarus without air connection to Europe. Also with us is Daria Sukarchuk, editor with Russian East West TV in Berlin. She thinks Putin is still pulling the strings of Lukashenko. If we want any kind of democratic change in Belarus, we have to talk to Putin. And a warm welcome too to Alexandra von Naaman, DW's Brussels bureau chief. She says sanctions against Belarus will be useless if the EU doesn't formulate a strategy that takes the role of Russia into account as well. Yeah, thank you very much indeed for great input there to begin with. And I'd like to go to Olga first and just ask you, Olga, is it fair to say that for anybody who wants to see peace and democracy in Belarus in the near future, this has been a, uh, how should I put it, disturbing few days? Well, definitely for me it was, uh, I would say, more shocking is disturbing. I mean, mm -hmm. we know that Belarus uh, is a long-lasting autocracy and... The whole things that we have been observing in Belarus since August 2020, these things are shocking uh, themselves. But what happened on the weekend is just, I mean, I like the fantasy to imagine, uh, to be able to imagine something like that. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a really, uh, I think it was a very emotional action, emotional decision and um, well, when we think about the consequences of the political and the economic consequences of this step, it's, it's really not adequate for me. So it's, I was really surprised, I was shocked. Yeah, and uh, am I right in saying that what we have seen in effect is a warning to journalists, a direct and very, and very dark warning to journalists that, uh, that critics of the regime are in danger? I would say really not only journalists, but everybody who is now who thought to be safe abroad, like the whole oppositional leaders and people working with them and people also representing here in Germany, like Belarusian diaspora, for example, activists uh, who speak up for Belarus. Of course, they are afraid also for their lives now because they do not uh, feel themselves uh, safe also within the European Union, which yeah. was different before, before this story. OK. Let's go to Alexandra von Naumann in, in Brussels. You have, Alexandra, for many years followed developments in Belarus, in Ukraine uh, and in, uh, in Moscow very, very closely. So what do you make of this apparent state-sponsored hijacking that we have witnessed? Well, I think that it was uh, certainly an unprecedented incident and I think that it's going to, cha to change um, the approach uh, of the European Union. And we saw it, uh, the reactions, uh, European leaders who were shocked and outraged and uh, uh, they uh, were describing the incident as a state-sponsored uh, terrorism, piracy, uh, but they were also very concerned because, uh, as they put it, uh, the lives of uh, EU citizens were at risk. We're talking here about hijacking, about uh, a diversion of a plane uh, that was on its way from one European, European uh, capital to the other. So I think uh, this is something that the European Union now um, um, has to deal with and, and it's uh, an incident that uh, is probably going uh, to put a lot of pressure on Brussels to, to do more. Olga, what do you say to that, that reaction in Brussels, outrage, fury, is it going to... Ch uh, the suggestion that it is perhaps a game-changer, is it going to be a game-changer? Well, we've already seen that it has at least begun to be a game-changer. I mean, the reaction was quite fast. It was also surprisingly fast for me. Uh, 
fast, hard and quite emotional and we can understand it. And we just heard one of the reasons for that, which is actually what is different now um, when we compare the situation before, the weekend and after. Mm, it's not only about democracy and human rights outside of the anymore, right? So it's about also the security of the European citizens. And I think it was one of the, re one of the main reasons why the decision was made that fast within just few hours, this hard decision that uh, Mrs. Tikhanovska was mm, kind of claiming for half a year or asking the EU uh, for, for, for half a year, also hard sanctions if they really come, this broad sectoral uh, uh, economic sanctions mm -hmm. we've been talking about for over oh, half a year already. And now this Ryan story happens and they're suddenly up uh, on the agenda. Uh, so it's, it's really a different level of, of danger for the European Union. It's not only, I say only, of course, it's important, democracy and human rights, but it's outside of the EU. And when we have citizens within the EU that un, are, put un, um, are put under danger by the uh, Belarusian authorities, it's another level of also of decisions and of political involvement. Mm -hmm. And uh, Alexandra, I'd just like to come back to you and just, uh, what, what, if, this, if this is a game changer, if there has been a tectonic shift in the approach towards Belarus, what, what, how is that likely to manifest itself in the weeks and months that lie ahead? Well, first of all, um, uh, what was just said is, is, is right, that uh, the decision was made very, very quickly. And it is very surprising. We just um, have to keep in mind that we had two uh, big crises and, and the attempts by the European Union to issue a joint statement. One of those was the Israel-Gaza uh, crisis and, and then China's crackdown on uh, opposition in Hong Kong. And in those very important foreign policy measures, or foreign policy matters rather, the European Union was not able to find a common position to issue a common statement because one member state um, blocked um, those decisions. And now here, within um, a few hours, you have uh, a strong response. You have concrete measures that were agreed on, uh, like this, this ban um, um, of um, landings uh, by the uh, state of Belarusian state-owned uh, carrier, uh, Belavia, for example, then the announcement of sanctions. And we are apparently talking here not only about targeted sanctions against individuals or companies, but we are apparently also talking about sanctions against whole uh, industry sectors. So uh, it really appears that the European Union, at least at the moment, is united and determined to punish Lukashenko and his regime uh, and also to make clear that they are not going to tolerate such incidents uh, in the future. Mm. Let's bring in Daria, Daria, it, 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 the, the, the Kremlin denies involvement in Sunday's operation, uh, but a lot of experts say that President Putin would have known about the hijacking incidents. What's your t take on that very important question? Did he know or did he not know? I think we're never going to know for sure if he personally said yes to this um, landing of a plane or if he was somehow talking to Lukashenko on the days before and they've agreed that this is the way they're going to get Protosevich. Uh, however, I think that it is not very important for us in Europe to know whether Putin was personally involved with this particular incident in the Minsk airport on May 23rd. What is important is that Putin is the biggest supporter of Lukashenko. He is giving him money. Uh, Russian border is essentially the only open water that still remains for Belarus. Uh, there is um, a lot of uh, interaction between these two governments and Putin essentially is the one pulling the strings of Lukashenko. Although Lukashenko is well known for acting on his own, he's not exactly completely controlled by Putin. That would not be true, mm -hmm. of course. Uh, however, I do think that if uh, Europe wants some kind of democratic change in Belarus, they have to take into account the position of Russia and, and talk to Russia as well. Yeah, uh, and when we talk about the significance of Russia and the significance of Vladimir Putin, it has been suggested that what we're actually experiencing is another exchange of fire in a, in a long, slowly escalating proxy war between, uh, between Minsk on one side and, and, and Moscow on one side and, uh, and the European Union on the other side. Is that too far-fetched? Well, it's a good question. I mean, uh, there is an interesting point of view that 
Uh, this particular act of Lukashenko, the landing of the Ryanair plane, is his way of burning the bridges with the European Union and mm -hmm. thus kind of closing up to Putin and showing that you really are my last supporter. I really have to depend on you 100% right now. Um, on the other hand, it is well known that Putin is not a fan of Lukashenko personally. Their personal relationship is not great. Uh, Lukashenko also doesn't really like Putin that much. And you could even see it in the way that the situation in Belarus was initially covered by the Russian state media like Russia Today when it all just started. Now it's very pro-Lukashenko, but at the beginning, they were even somehow sympathetic for the protesters. Mm -hmm. The first few days, it quickly changed, however it is. However, what we can also look at is the treatment of the Russian citizen, Lukashenko's girlfriend, uh, Sofia Sapega, who is detained in Belarus. And we do not really see many attempts of the Russian politicians to try to free her. Maria Zaharova, the spokesperson of the Russian foreign uh, ministry, said that the Russian consul in Minsk has talked to her, but that was all she said. They didn't say, oh, we're working hard to free her. She's innocent. None of that. Uh, so there must have been some kind of coordination between Minsk, Minsk and Moscow in this particular case. We will probably never know the extent of it. OK, let's go back to Roban Protasevich and find out what his young political career tells us about the current generation of protesters and the mood in Belarus itself. Solidarity with Roman Protasevich. The 26-year-old co-founded the Telegram channel Nechta, where he reported on demonstrations, arrests and violence in Belarus. He is now living in exile in Lithuania. Back in his homeland, he was wanted on charges including inciting protests against Lukashenko. Last Sunday, a Ryanair plane travelling between two EU countries was forced to land at the airport in Minsk by a Belarusian military jet under the pretext of a bomb scare. Protasevich and his girlfriend were arrested immediately. Three other passengers who boarded the plane in Athens did not arrive at their destination in Vilnius, Lithuania. They were, according to Ryanair CEO Michael O'Leary, Belarusian Secret Service KGB agents. A video of Protasevich has since been released. In it, he states that he is being treated fairly by the authorities. Viewers, however, believe it was obtained by force. Is the Protasevich affair likely to explode? Olga, how explosive is the situation surrounding Roman Protasevich? Well, it's quite frightening. I mean, we still have death penalty in Belarus. Belarus is the only uh, European country where death penalty is still in practice, and in practice uh, literally every year. And uh, he could uh, face up to 15 years, but uh, we never know mm, how the situation develops. I mean, in the worst case, I really hope it doesn't happen, but this danger is still it's there. It's being talked about as a very genuine, uh, shocking possibility. Uh, Yes, but once again, he's, I mean, <laughs> these death penalty cases, we see it every year in Belarus. And it's, it's, it's really about the, the nature of the autocratic state. And it was never abolished in Belarus. That's the problem. And he, he's actually seen, uh, officially seen as a terrorist in Belarus. And it's something really different just to be an oppositional leader or human rights defender or uh, to be percepted as a terrorist. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting mixture. Journalist, blogger, opposition journalist, uh, activist, if you so will, dissident, mm -hmm. he's been described. How much does he, does he represent his generation? Because he's still a very young man. He's 26 years old. Uh, well, yes, he is young, but I mean, the role that, uh, not he personally, I mean, he, there was a group of people who were uh, in charge of this Telegram channel, Nechta. It was crucial for organizing uh, the protests in Belarus last year. It was not the reason for the protests, but they managed through Telegram channels, uh, through social media, to organize people, to mobilize them. And we saw hundreds of thousands of people on the street. So it was, it's not about his personality. It's, it was real political danger for Lukashenko. Back then. <laughs> but when you mention his personality, there is, I, you know, I read constantly that there is a very personal element to the animosity between the blogger and the president? 
Well, I don't know that. I can only think that it could be true. I mean, Lukashenko is a person who, who never forgives his fines and he is a very revenge-oriented person. Mm. Of course, this we cannot exclude this psychological factor, but once again, it was a real political danger back then. So it's, it's not only about some personalities. It's about organizing a revolution in Belarus, or one, one of the organizers of protests, physical or physically organizing the protest. Mm -hmm. The people were ready to protest. They had this protest mood, but they managed to do it uh, through social media. And I think, it's, of course, it's also interesting for security forces just to get uh, this information out of him, how it really happened, why, uh, why it was that successful. I think they have the feeling, the state, I think the Belarusian state has not understood what actually happened. They still want to understand what was it, what was it last year. These protests, unprecedented protests that lasted half a year, they still want to know what is behind it. And it's not about Nechta or Protasevich, it's about people, it's about the changed political reality in Belarus, but they still have this hope if they close everybody in prison or make them leave the country, the situation will come back, but it will not come back. Alexandra, how are people? And Peter, yeah. Yeah, maybe I can just jump in if, if you allow me, yes. uh, because I think this, um, it could also be that this incident, uh, it's not only about uh, the blogger, uh, it's also about sending a message to the West that Lukashenko is apparently thinking he can act with, with impunity, he can do whatever he wants to without fearing any major consequences. Uh, and this also could be a strong message to all uh, uh, other, um, you know, uh, opposition figures, uh, journalists, uh, uh, civil society members, look, no one uh, can protect you. I can get you. Uh, and this is, of course, uh, a, a, a very, very dangerous uh, development. But that could be also um, part of his thinking behind what happened uh, in Minsk. Daria, what's your, what's your response to this, uh, this debate about whether the, you know, the personality of, the, of Protasevich is, is important whether, or whether he's part of a generation? Is it the individual or is it, the, is it the, 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 the people surrounding him and people working with him as well? I think it's more of the Telegram channel Nechta because I can say as a journalist, they, you cannot call them proper journalists. They are biased. They use uh, even the figures of what you can say hate speech. Uh, I'm mm -hmm. sure Olga can enlighten us more on this later. But uh, they use very derogatory phrases. So, for example, they use the term Lukashist, which is a, a mixture of two words, fascist, fascist, and Lukashenko. So they are openly calling uh, Belarusian police um, sadists. Like, they, they are very kind of spreading this very particular, very aggressive protest mood on their Telegram channel. However, they were very good at reporting protests. They had a video feed, several videos uploaded every day, showing protests happening in very different cities around Belarus. So they were, of course, they were not why the protest happened, but they were an important part of the protest movement. They were a way for people to feel connected uh, and they played a very important role in that regard. And I think that is why Lukashenko hates Protasevich so much. Olga, what can you add to that for us? I do completely agree. I mean, I also agree with the hate speech. Uh, we see it actually on both levels, on the, st on the level of state media, but also on the level of Telegram channels. It's, it's really, well, the Belarusian society is now really deeply divided and it's not that good. But think about perspectives for the time after Lukashenko, if we could imagine any kind of reconciliation in society, it makes it really, really hard. Um, but if you allow me to come back, just to change the, to come back to the topic of the European reaction, because I would like to react to uh, this um, comment uh, from, from the colleague in Brussels, um, that with this air ban for Belarusian airlines, uh, the EU um, intends to punish um, the Belarusian regime, which is understandable for me. But we, uh, as I've said in this uh, statement at the beginning, I mean, the question I'm asking myself the whole time, I mean, what happens with the whole Belarusian, with all the Belarusians that are kind of, unfortunately, and I'm sure unintendedly, from the EU, but still kind of locked within their own country where such unprecedented level of um, repression still happening. I mean, we know that um, since the end of 2020, Belarusians have problems crossing the land border of Belarus because of the official of COVID regulations, but we know that most probably the reasons um, are political. So air flights has been the only way for those who wanted 
to leave the country out of political reasons till now. Now, if, if it really happens that Belarusian airlines cannot enter the European Union, what happens with the people? I mean, I just want to ask if this aspect was some kind of also um, discussed on the EU level or you think it could some kind be changed within uh, the, the upcoming months or um, is, it, is it on the agenda? Alexandra, in Brussels. So it's not... Yes, uh, it's not officially on the agenda, uh, but uh, um, it's uh, fair to say uh, that we can assume that uh, that uh, was discussed during um, the summit of uh, the EU leaders here in Brussels, because of course they know that the European Union is walking a tight rope here. They want um, a rope here. They want to punish uh, the regime. They don't want to punish uh, the people of Belarus. They want to support and strengthen the civil society. But I think that the first reaction and this uh, over flight ban and then the ban for Belavia to land at um, Benning, um, um, Belavia from landing at the European airports, it was uh, also about safety. We, we talk about that. Uh, and then, of course, it was also about sending a strong signal. I can imagine that, you know, that they can uh, review those measures after a while. And of course, uh, um, they understand that it's also going to affect uh, normal citizens. Uh, but we have uh, to mention that there were even uh, much more extreme measures on the table that were discussed here in Brussels, like uh, uh, cutting off, banning all traffic, even uh, including ground uh, transit from Belarus to the European Union. Mm -hmm. And they um, said no to, to those uh, proposals. So uh, that's always a difficult decision uh, how to, you know, punish the government and not to punish the people. Uh, and of course, you have to find uh, um, a solution that all members can agree on. Mm -hmm. mm. Thank you. Okay, very interesting. Those are the proposals. What do, what do people in Brussels imagine the impact of those proposals is likely to be, again, in the, in the coming days, weeks and months? Well, they are certainly hoping to um, change the regime's behavior. Um, but as we could see in the past, um, Lukashenko more or less shrugged off everything that Brussels was doing, any other sanctions imposed on the regime. Uh, but now uh, they seem to be willing to go even further to, uh, to sanction, uh, to, to impose sanctions against, um, you know, whole industrial sectors, hoping that that could uh, change Lukashenko's behavior, uh, change the situation on the ground. And the other thing that they are talking about and um, um, have also uh, implemented uh, is, uh, is uh, you know, to, to provide uh, the civil society with chances uh, to, to grow, to support them. Uh, they decided to, to uh, they are going to spend 24 million, uh, million euros to, to, to do that. So uh, that's also another um, thing that they uh, are willing to do. However, we have to say that their toolbox is, is limited as long as uh, the Russian president, Vladimir Putin, is supporting uh, Minsk politically, but also um, economically. Yeah, and at the top of the show, Olga said that it is of the essential importance that we, uh, the EU, uh, talk directly to Vladimir Putin about the future of Belarus. What did you have in mind there? Uh, I don't see that there is a, some big meeting of Putin with, say, Josep Borrell or Ursula von der Leyen. However, there is an important meeting between Vladimir Putin and Joe Biden, the president of the United States in Geneva, if I am not mistaken, middle of June. Yeah. That could potentially be uh, the moment when they will talk about it. And as far as I remember, the U.S. state has actually confirmed that Belarus is on the agenda. So... Maybe they can talk about something there, mm -hmm. uh, but it is very hard to do any kind of predictions here. Putin is known to act rather unpredictably. Another important thing is that there is a general election, a uh, presidential election as well, in Russia uh, in September the 19th, actually one week before Germany has a general election. Putin does not want to show, probably will not want to show any weaknesses before that. And that's really soon. September is not, not far away. Um, however, we cannot, people often say that, oh, Putin would like to 
annex Belarus and completely merge Russia and Belarus, uh, because this will give him the same boosted rating as he did with Crimea in 2014. That's not true. There is no second Crimea. Crimea did have a certain effect on Putin's rating. He re it really did go through the roof the moment it was annexed. It is deflated now again. Uh, but Belarus isn't some country that Russians want to see integrated into Russia. It's, Crimea was such an issue. This was the only existing one. This is now gone. So it is really hard to predict what Putin is welcome, uh, is ready to put on the bargaining table with Biden. Olga, do you have any reason to be immediately optimistic about the situation? Just to round up the show today that or might help some oppositional forces in the end. If we see the sanctions, maybe they will have uh, more weight here in Europe than they used to be before due to this, uh, uh, due to this uh, Ryanair story. But uh, I don't know, really. I, okay. It's really everything is happening there. It's OK, we'll have to leave it there. Uh, we've been talking about the latest crisis in Belarus. So thank you very much for joining us. I hope we've provided you with plenty of food for thought. Bye bye.